Welcome. Today we are doing a presentation on witchcraft in ancient Greece. Now we've done a general video on, on Greek magic, that world, but today we're taking a deeper dive into the evil magic that rocked the ancient world. Witchcraft is the English word, right, for, for evil magic. And there's a few different definitions, but overall it is the only real English word for evil magic. And the Greeks didn't have such a word. They had a word for poisoners. They had a word for necromancers. They had a word for people who place curses upon others. Um, but they didn't have a generalized word for it. Um, and that's why we're going to be referring to it as witchcraft. So we know what witchcraft is like later on, right, in the English or speaking world, right? But what was witchcraft to the ancient Greeks? What was bad magic, right? What was considered evil magic? And there's perhaps no better way uh, to tell that than by looking at the descriptions um, of the most famous Greek witches, right? Hecate, Medea, Circe, Erichtha, right? Now our first witch, Hecate, um, was actually a goddess, right, of witchcraft. But Diodorus humanized her here, which I think is I think is telling and interesting. He humanizes her as an actual mortal, but is still going to be the mother of magic, right? Persis had a daughter, Hakate, and she excelled her father in her brazen lawlessness. She was fond of the hunt. With it, her luck, it would turn the bow upon men instead of beasts, right? Killing people, that's bad. She was a keen, contri keen contriver of mixtures of deadly drugs, formaca, right, the formaca. And she discovered the so-called aconite. She tested the powers of each drug by mixing it into the food given to strangers, right? So she was experimenting with these poisons on just random innocent people, okay? Um, she destroyed her father with a drug and so overtook the throne, okay? So that's, that's an obvious one, poison, right? We talk about witchcraft in the ancient world, that's going to be the, the number one real killer here is going to be poisons because there is a culture of, of, of poisons, right? Of the formaki making a poison and selling it to someone that, so they can kill their significant other or someone they don't like or in order to take the throne, things of that nature. And there's also <laughs> another problem with poison and that a lot of people are trying to use it for other means. They're not trying to kill someone. Um, but they're creating this, this concoction that's going to kill someone. A lot, a very common example is a love potion, right? I want this person to fall in love with me, so I'm going to like slip this in their drink and then it kills them, right? Um, that still falls under, uh, according to the Greeks, that falls under witchcraft, right? Because, um, the end result, uh, whether the purpose was innocent, um, or not, the end result is evil, right? And so, that was also considered evil witchcraft, the attempted manipulation of people against their will, right? Force someone to fall in love with you, uh, force someone to do this, um, was considered evil witchcraft for that reason. <clears throat> On Medea, right? Um, this, this bit's interesting. She prepared a follow, hollow effigy of Artemis and hid within it all sorts of powerful drugs. Now, again there, Artemis, right? The goddess of nature, of, of the hunt. Okay, so we have a very early, early on, we have a, a connection between nature and witchcraft and magic. Medea also anointed her own hair with certain powerful agents to make it gray. And she filled her face and body with wrinkles with the result that of those that who saw her to all means, to their eyes, she would be an old woman, okay? So we have the first appearance of the hag here in, in Medea, like the magical ability for a witch uh, to turn themselves into a hag. That is the first connection there um, that we see very early on. Another stereotype we can see in, these, in the description of these famous Greek witches um, is, is this one. When the night had fallen and Peleus had gone to sleep, Medea told them, as in a, 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 their, her coven, more or less, these young girls, that they must boil Peleus's body in a cauldron, right? So 
the idea of a witch boiling someone in a cauldron, this comes very early on in, in Medea, right? This, that stereotype does. As well as the idea of a, a corruption of the youth, of the spoiling of the minds of girls, young girls. Another thing is going to happen here. She's going to convince, Medea's going to convince these young girls to kill their father, right? The idea of patricide or matricide. We see much later on with the idea of um, a devotion to the devil, right? I must kill my parents to to um, achieve acceptance by, by Satan. So we see this idea of, of evil magic and and murdering one's parents connected very early on here. Now, these, right, these descriptions of these famous earlier Greek witches, right, um, they're not nice, right? They're bad. They're not good. They're not good descriptions of witches, right? They're doing bad things. But, but I want you to pay very close attention to the next witch I'm going to describe, right? Um, who's going to come much later on. Right, we're talking. You know, the descriptions of Medea, uh, of of Hecate are coming in the deep BC period. When we get to this next witch, Erythro, this is in 61 AD. So I want you to notice as I'm reading this how the description of the witch has changed. Um, fair warning: this is on ancient witchcraft. This is gonna we're gonna get into the revolting stuff now. Uh, so you you've been warned. This is gonna get disgusting and grim and grotesque in a hurry, because we're going to be addressing necromancy. This is in Frisala, right, uh, of Lucan's Frisala in 61 AD, the description of Erichtho. Wild Erichtho had condemned as too pious the wicked rites, the criminal practices of a dreadful race. She had directed her corrupt craft toward new rites, for it is her crime to put her deathly head under a roof of the city or the protection of the household gods. She inhabits abandoned graves and takes over tombs after driving, driving out the shades or ghosts. She is welcome to the gods of Erebus. Neither the gods nor her still living state forbid her from hearing the assemblies of the silent dead or knowing the Stygian houses of the secrets of the buried dis. Right? The impious woman visage exhibits a foul and wasted decay her horrible face is burdened by the Stygian pallor and uncombed locks. It is unknown to bright sky. She delights in laying funeral fires. Together with incense, she has stolen the lighted pyre. The gods concede to her every criminal prayer at first asking, and they dread to hear the second spell. She snatches from the middle of the pyres the smoking ashes of the young, together with their burning bones. She collects the very torch the parents held, the remains of the funeral byre, fluttering about in black smoke, the clothes as they dissolve into cinders, and the ashes that smell of burnt limbs. Right? She, she's diving in there to collect body parts. She plunges her hands into the eyes and delights to have dug out the frozen balls. She gnaws at, gnaws at the pale nails of the dried out hand. She breaks with her jaws and noose and the noose in its harmful knots. She plucks at the hanging corpse and scrapes off crosses. She tears at guts beaten upon rainstorms and bone marrow rusted in the rays of the sun. She takes the iron nail that pierces the hands, the corrupt black matter that runs over the limbs, the congealed slime. She hangs off muscles that are resistant to her bite. And should the body be lying exposed on the ground, she takes up her position beside it before the wild beasts and birds arrive. She has no wish to harvest limbs with a knife, but with her own hands. Babies are dragged out from a slashed open belly, not the way nature intended to be laid upon hot altars. Whenever she needs cruel and brazen shade, she herself manufactures the ghosts. Every human death is of some use to her, okay? So you, we're gonna stop there, but you get the idea. Look at how much more disgusting and revile and, and, and grotesque the description of this witch is in 61 AD, as opposed to the uh, the earlier BC descriptions of Medea um, and Hecate, all right?
right? It's much more frightening, evil, and foul. This is very important to notice this because the description of foul erythro directly correlates with a trend we are going to see when we get to the source evidence of spells and cursed tablets. Unfortunately, the horror of the Thessalian witch Erichtho was based on something very real happening in the ancient world. The description of Erichtho and the, the terrible mutilation of corpses post-mortem um, for magical purposes was known as necromancy, right? A very real and at times really grotesque um, form of magic in ancient times. In, it, in its benign form, it could be playing around with a crystal ball or a lamp and, and reciting a certain spell to get, to get a ghost to appear before you even tell you some things, all right? Um, it's similar to a fortune teller asking, you know, the dead something. In, in its most horrific form, though, it involved the mutilation of corpse, eating pieces of corpse, or engaging in sex acts with the corpse in order to communicate with it. And perhaps at its very worst could require the assistance and sometimes sacrifice of young boys. Hey, okay, so, <laughs> right? Um, this is where that's going to come from. Like the stereotype of witches snatching children, um, it's going to come from necromancy, right? Necromancy is this, this art that either came from it's believed to either come from Persia or Egypt and, and migrate into, into Greece. I'll give you an idea that this, this Erichtho, right, this description, Lucan's description of Erichtho is not an exaggeration, uh, but an accurate description of the most extreme form of necromancy and of witchcraft during the time. It is not friendly, it is grotesque, and it is disgusting. There's a reason people are fearing it, and, um, if you'd like to turn it off the video now, if you don't want to hear what's coming next, that you probably don't. Okay, so uh, strong of heart, especially strong of uh, stomach, uh, if you're going to continue watching this, because we're about to get into the really nasty stuff here. Um, but I feel it's necessary to get the idea that um, that what I'm saying is, is indeed accurate. Um, this spell requires. The fat of a dabbled goat and blood, defilement, embryo of a dog, the bloody discharge of a virgin dead untimely, a young boy's heart, mixed in vinegar and both salt and with crab claws, sage, a single onion and mouse pellets, and an egg of a young ibis. You will slay a man and drink the blood of this man and eat his ash. Then take all his skin and put it into your vagina. Anyway, um, I think you get the idea that, right, that this, this witchcraft taking place is very vile, very disgusting. Um, and we're just skipping over the fact that it required the heart of a young boy and the blood of a virgin untimely, right? So they're going to have to, at the very least, they're going to have to um, either kidnap a child in order to do this and slay them, or they're going to have to find a relatively recently deceased uh, corpse um, that still, the heart is still relatively intact to, to perform this spell. And therein lies one of the uh, an obvious reason, right, that, that a witch might uh, attack a child. Some of the other ones, though, are, are more innocent seeming, right? It's one of it's like wrap wrap a naked boy in linen from head to toe and then clap your hands, <laughs> right? After after making a ringing noise, place the boy opposite the sun, standing behind him. Say this formula, right? So that what they're doing a lot of times, if if a child is not an ingredient, right, in a spell, right, they're not, he's not been killed or is not already dead, and then they're taking parts of him to use in some spell, what they're doing is using the boy as a medium. For some reason, uh, they, they have this idea that a young virgin boy um, is a really good medium who can see and communicate with spirits of the dead uh, and demons, and that's why they're, they're using this boy, right? So either they would pay the child uh, to do this, or you know the, the, the parents would give permission, or the child would be, of course, kidnapped. 
for this purpose, or borrowed, or perhaps never seen again, right? Um, so <laughs> the witchcrafts, right, witchcrafts fascination, especially the necromancers' fascination uh, with children is going to create some fantastical fears, right, in the mind of the ancient person. That fear is ultimately going to evolve into the idea of the Strix, right, which is the belief that a member of the occult can transform into a werebird-like creature and kidnap or kill their children, right? Now, we're going to have a separate video that focuses on the Strix witch coming up. And for other witchcraft transformations of the Greek world, uh, we do have a video on werewolves that, that covers that and the transformation of... Uh, into a wolf by witchcraft, right? By evil means, specifically cannibalistic acts. We're going to look at this spell here, right? Um, and <laughs> and um, interestingly, some of this is going to come up again. Of serpents are you dark? O oh, you with hair of serpents, serpent girded who drink blood, I who bring death and destruction, who feast on hearts, flesh eater, who devour those dead untimely, and you make grief resound and spread madness. Come to my sacrifices, and f now for me do you fulfill this matter. Offer in the right for doing good. Offer storix, myrrh, sage, frankincense, and a fruit pit. Right. So for doing good with this, for this spell, offer plant matter right? For doing evil, for doing harm, offer magical material of a dog and a dappled goat, or in a similar way, a virgin untimely dead. So that, that appears again. Protective charm from the right, take a lodestone and on it carved a three-faced hakate. Let the middle face of the baby wearing horns, the left face a dog, and the right one a goat. After the... <laughs> After the carving is done, clean with natron and water, and dip in the blood of one who has died a violent death, right? So they need to go play with corpses in order to do this spell. Then make a food offering to it and say that, that this spell, the following spell, right? So, <laughs> and that's just from a protective charm from the right. In order to protect yourself from this evil curse that's being put upon you, you have to go raid it. You have to go grave robbing and get some blood from a corpse, right? In order to protect yourself from this this horror. So, so necromancy, right, is, is something that's pretty universal in the the ancient world, right? Odysseus does it, right, in the Odyssey, because he has to go to Hades. He has to talk to, I believe, Theseus, right? Um, there's there's multiple Greek heroes, Jason. Jason of, the, Jason of the Argonauts does, performs necromancy, right? So it, it's, and they do it in not such a disgusting way, but but it's something that's going to be extremely common in the ancient world itself. In this verse here, we're going to look at someone who is going to use, right, the goddess of which have Hakate. Now, I've had some people comment that Hakate is not bad. I don't care, right? Um, you can read the stuff yourself, right, that these... Evil individuals are making prayers to Hakate as, as she is being treated as an evil entity that will carry out their their ill deeds, right? And, and so that's what we're talking about when we say Hakate is this evil entity, right? Because the evil people are treating her as one and using her in this way. Three-headed goddess, lady of the night, who fucked on filth, O virgin, <laughs> thou key-holding Persafa, Core out of Tartarus, grim-eyed, dreadful, child-girt with fiery serpents, has mixed with tears and bitter groans left over from its own food, so that you, luckless heroes, right? So he's calling um, Hakate to bring them heroes of the dead uh, to assist them in this matter. And the matter is going to be um, forcing someone to be in love with them, right? Um who, who are confined in this place, right, Hades, may bring success to him who is beset with these torments. O oh, unfortunate ones, bring success to him who is distressed at heart because of her. O oh, ungodly and unholy, 
So bring her racked with torment and in haste. Give heed to me and I rouse I her. On this night from her eyes remove sweet sleep and cause her wretched care and fearful pain. Cause her to follow after my footsteps. For, for will give her a willingness until she does what I command of her. O Mistress Akate, Lady of the Crossroads, O Black Bitch, send up to me phantoms of the dead forthwith for this service this very hour. Right? So look at how he's describing Hakate, right? Lady of the Night, fucked on filth, all right? Grim eyed, dreadful, um, fiery serpents mixed with tears, right? Um, Lady of the Cross was well, black bitch, right? She's not described as this nice deity. Now, the ingredients for the spell, right? <laughs> Some dreadful incense, a dappled goat's fat, blood and filth, the menstrual flow of a virgin dead, <laughs> heart of one untimely dead, the magical material of a dead dog, a woman's embryo. Um, it, it, it goes on and on with a bunch of other crap, right? So, Necromancy is going to be extremely disgusting. They have to, in order to perform their spells, they got to get all sorts of weird and grotesque pieces of people, of corpses, right? Um, <laughs> all right, so what you're doing is, and they've got to get them early on, too, is the really disturbing fact of this, right? They're not just going in... I mean, they can, but a lot of these specific things, there's like, you need this bone or something, you can go and loot a grave that's been around for 20, you know, 20 years, 5 years, a year, right? They've been in the ground for a while, they can go loot them. Um, this specific time of material, what you're talking about, and why this is so offensive, uh, the Greeks took proper burial rites very, very seriously, right? You could not rest in the afterlife properly. Right and go on to the next phase without a proper burial, and this so this was very very important to all the family members, to all those that loved and cared for that person who had died. And you're talking about this necromancer, this witch, needing to get in there early, right? As soon as they've buried the corpse, as soon as they've put it on the funeral pyre. At, maybe even as they're preparing last rites before they've put it in the ground, this witch must get there, get into the person's, in this case, the woman's private parts to gather some sort of menstrual flow or to gather an embryo of a fetus, right? Extract this from the corpse. <laughs> right? So... This is not nice behavior, right? This is something that if they're gonna if they get caught doing this, they're gonna be killed, right? If not by the person's family who catches them, uh, by the authorities, they're gonna be put to death, right? Because this is really heinous and grotesque behavior and in, in violation of the rights of the dead. Uh, that the Greeks believe that the dead deserve these basic rights to be left in peace, and. Um, a lot of times, not even before they're, they're in the ground, these necromancers are coming at them like vultures to try to get parts off of them. And so we can see by this description alone, Lucan's description of Erichtho is not an exaggeration, right? It's an understatement, <laughs> okay? Because we can see by the spells written by these people themselves that they're up to far worse things than what Lucan described in his in his, Thess his character of the Thessalian Erypho, right? They're up to some much more disturbing behavior, all right? We'll, we'll look at another one, right, to another idea of a curse in, in the form of love binding, which, it, as we mentioned earlier, right, is a form of, of evil magic because you're forcing someone to do something against their will. And chances are, if somebody's doing this kind of spell, they're, they're an evil individual to begin with, right? Uh, because they're having to call on certain things that, that a normal individual would not do. Um, we'll look at this spell here. I entrust this binding spell to you, those who holds the key of fate, Hades, to the infernal gods and demons, to the men 
who have died untimely deaths to the youths and maidens from year to year, month to month, hour to hour. I adjure all demons in this place to stand as assistants beside this demon and arouse yourself from me, whoever you are, whether male or female, and go to every place and to every quarter, uh, to, into every house, and it, I, attract I and bind her. Let her be in love with me, whom she bore, bore. Let their, let her not be had in a promiscuous way. Let her not be had in her ass, nor let her do anything with another man for pleasure, just me alone. She is not to have peace of mind, nor to be able to sleep, um, because I adjure you by the name that causes fear and trembling, the earth opens, the name at whose terrifying sound the demons are terrified, name at whose sound rivers, rocks burst asunder. I adjure you, God of the dead, whether male or female, do not fail, God of the dead, to heed my commands. Yeah, so in, instead drag her by the hair, by the heart, by her soul to me at every hour, day or night. Um, may she remain inseparable from me. Do this, bind her for all time of my life, and help force her to be serviceable to me. Okay, so I think you get the gist, right? She's actually, it mentions in here, the spell, not even of her own husband, right? So she's a married woman. This guy, this, this wizard, is trying to steal um, by the help of demons, right? Or in this case, demons, but it would be a very similar thing. Um, he's calling on the evil demons, which would be demons. Um, in the Greek world. This is a curse um, here to to end, and it's also necromancy, right? Because he's calling on a demon to help him. I exhort you, demon of the dead, and the necessity of death which has happened in your case, to hear my request and avenge me. N Nelaimon, whom Tortarius bore, because Etus has brought a charge against me, against my daughter Achinus and or her children or those who might have ever been with me. And I exhort you not to listen to those who have brought charges against me. Um, <laughs> I ask you, demon of the dead, not to listen to them, but only to me. Right? So what what's happening here is he's done something bad. He's going to court. He's going on trial for it. And these people are witnesses, and he is basically trying to rig the the trial to uh, allow him to get off with it um, with the help of this demon, right? Now, when we look at these curses, right? Um, and we didn't read too many of them, but I think you get the gist here. With all these these curses going around, there's a lot of mean ones that we didn't read about people. Uh, being bonded and whatnot, and and we can take a look here. This is a to give you an idea. This is a doll, right? A, a voodoo doll found um, found and and in, in Athens and a cemetery in Athens. And this doll was found in a grave where pieces and limbs of the corpse were missing. Right. So this is a cursed doll. This is a binding doll. They want this person bound and and mutilated in death, right? So a necromancer has come in, they have bound the living person, and the reason they bound the doll and put it in their grave is that they have, the most likely reason is that they have stolen some of the limbs of the person to use for magical purposes, right? They have, they have dismembered that corpse and disfigured it, and they have bound this doll, this effigy of that corpse, to keep their spirit from coming after them, right? To keep the spirit from coming after them for disfiguring their corpse, right? That is, that is a very likely reason. The other likely reason for this here is, is they are trying to force the ghost of this person to help them do something by magical means and probably something that's not very nice, right? To help them kill another person, to help them rape some individual, um, something along those lines, but there's physical, right, archaeological evidence of that all of these spells that we've been reading through, right, are are things that actually happen, right, things that did occur in this time, and it's worth mentioning that these voodoo dolls, right, these little creepy voodoo dolls, 
are being used by in witchcraft to do all sorts of strange things, right? They're um, they're being wounded to cause harm. Yes, um, the dolls are to cause harm to the actual person, the effigy, or actually it's called a colossi of, right? The, the doll is called a colossi. Um, but it's also being used to force sexual attraction between the two. Like right? I'm going to make a colossi of me, a doll of me, and a doll of another person. And I'm going to bind them together so that we are bound together. I'm going to, um, another thing would be to cause harm, right? With that in the form of plague, or at least it's believed there's an episode in Ephesus um, in, in 165 AD where they believe that um, the, the dolls, the witches' dolls that have been planted out all over the city it is what is causing certain individuals be uh, inflicted with plague, right? So that they're going to, under the guidance of Artemis, so they believe, uh, are going to go all around the city, destroy and burn all the witches' dolls to rescue the city from plague itself. So the Greeks, right, with, with all these curses, right, going around, right, of enacting terrible things, like generalized harm to another person, forcing another person to fall in love with someone they don't love and don't want to love. Um, all, all these types of things, including like casting plague with, with spells and, and, and plastic il casting illness with them, all sorts of, of things like that, uh, and cursing them, this is going to... I, I mean, this is really going to cause quite the, the uproar in, in the general public. Right? And, and there's a reason why. This stuff is really common. And we'll, let's look at what Plato has to say about it. Right? Um, we'll, we'll look at what old Plato has to say about this. The beggar priests and prophet go doors to doors of the rich. Right? And then try to persuade them that they, that they, they have power acquired from the gods by sacrifices and incantations to cure with pleasures and festivals any wrong done by the man himself or on his ancestors and that they will harm an enemy a, ma a just man or a just man alike for a small fee right so people are going right this is so common that individuals are going door to door these magicians are and be like hey i can put a curse on whoever you want i can cause harm to this person i can get rid of this guy if you don't like him stuff like that anything they can get for money right so curses are very very common and when we we'll look here right <laughs> but let us address those who take up the wild belay that the gods do not care or are placable those who in contempt for men charm the souls of many of the living by alleging that they charm the souls of the dead. They undertake to persuade the gods to the practice of sorceries with sacrifices and prayers and try to destroy the root and branch individuals and entire houses for the sake of money, right? So they're like, you can communicate with your dead son, whatever, uh, uh, stuff like that. Um, and, then, and then charge them an enormous amount of money to do that, right? And if a man appears to be like one causing harm by bindings, right, uh, or charms, or certain incantations, or any poisoning, right, of this sort whatsoever, right, he is to be executed. So you get the idea that a lot of this crap is going on around here, and, and people are <laughs> afraid of it, right? We can see by the spells, this is common practice. We can see by the commentary on it that this is common practice. Uh, and, and the archaeological evidence, right, confirms that this is a common practice in terms of curses, in terms of poisons, in terms of necromancy. And so the general public is very afraid, and they're adopting all sorts of amulets of protection, right, including the evil eye. A lot of times it's actually a, a penis, right, a, fail, a, fail, a phallic symbol to protect from witchcraft. Um, but later on, that becomes what we know is the Greek eye, right? Um, a eye that protects from the evil eye because it's gotten so bad that, and people have become so fearful that they believe an evil person or a witch can curse them simply by looking at them, right? And that's, that's how much hysteria has evolved from this.
So all the good, right, that, that magic had done in the Greek world, right, um, that assisted with the evolvement of philosophy, it had assisted with the, um, the evolution of medicine, right? All these things are happening, right? And it would be used by doctors for healing, etc., etc., etc. Magic is an integral part of, was an integral part of the Olympian religion. <clears throat> but for all, for all the good things that magic had wrought during this time, the evil magic, the witchcraft, had grown in such prevalence, not only prevalence in, in terms of commonality, but in disgust and grotesqueness had evolved, right? To the point where people are stealing parts from corpses of, of, of penetrating people's private parts in order of, of the dead in order to cast spells are harming young children in order to cast spells, right? This sort of evolution becomes too, becomes unsustainable for, for magic in general and especially, right, for a society that is ruled by magic, right? So it has become unsustainable as it evolved and increased in wickedness over time to the point that the pagan Roman government is going to end the practice altogether and the demonization of not only witchcraft but of magic in general is going to flourish due to the fear of, of, these, of the institution of evil magic during that time. And so we could see very early on in the ancient world, in the Greek world, evolving into the Roman world, these stereotypes, right, these malicious stereotypes are going to come from a real place that is going to carry on throughout time to the modern era um, that is going to involve the, the persecution of magic users, right, of even, yes, of evil witches as well. But of general magic users, generalized uh, healers, um, and of course, we, and of course, especially when it gets to the Renaissance um, during the witch fervor, innocent people, right? So all of this is going to have a profound impact on the future of of Western civilization. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, next, we'll be doing one on this Strix witch, right? How this fear and this fervor. Uh, of child snatching evolved into giving the witch even more fantastical powers than were originally espoused to her, right? Um, the witch becomes supernatural now, um, and uh, people are so worried about their children, right? Uh, and, and perhaps for good reason. So we'll address that in our next video. I thank you all for watching. If you have questions, um, if you have comments, feel, feel free to add them. I'm happy to answer anything you might ask. Um, you all have a, a great rest of your day, and I'm sorry it took me a while to do the video. Uh, it's uh, a lot of work, it keeps me very, very busy um, for my job, and uh, I don't have as much time as I'd like to make these, unfortunately, but um, uh, yeah, I'm going to keep making them, at the very least, periodically, because I, I enjoy uh, history, and, and doing this sort of thing it gives me an outlet to you know, continue doing history, like, oh yeah, research project, I'll make a video, you know, I'll do a research project, I'll make a video on what I found and, and what I think on a certain topic. Um, yeah, y'all have a great rest of your day and thank you as always for, uh, for watching.